Hey everybody, Kerry Waldy here, and this video is with Todd Zeremic, DPE and airline captain. We asked him to sit down and, and uh, help those who are interested in interviewing for an airline position on how they should prepare and some questions that might be asked on an airline interview and how to approach those questions. So it's really good information. There's some jump cuts here because I edited out some non-pertinent stuff, but enjoy this video. Godspeed. So I think, Ben, actually, to address the question that you had earlier, why the difference between a regional interview and a major interview? Um, there, and there really isn't. This is the same questions you're going to get, right? I, you know, Eddie Shipman does United interviews. So these, I don't, he, he's not allowed to hand over the questions that he's, they ask, but he could, he could go, yeah, that's probably similar. Um, but that's sort of the crux of it that we were talking about, which is at the regional level, we we know that you don't know yet. Now, I shouldn't say we because I'm not at the regional level and I don't do interviewing for them, but, but they know where you came from. They know that you were, you've been a flight instructor the past two years. You're here to interview. Um, you've never flown anything that's more than 12,500 pounds, I assume. You know, maybe you caught a ride here and there on something that you probably couldn't log anyway. But, um, so they know that you don't know that much. They know that you're going to come into their organization. They're going to teach you their FOM, their flight operations manual. They're going to teach you their AOM, their aircraft operations manual, and their policies, procedures, and all that. But then when you get to the, the, the major stage, uh, nobody gets hired right off the, you know, from flight instructing into flying for American Airlines. So the expectation is that you know more. You're more experienced. You're more, more educated from, you've taken a couple of type rides, a couple of different courses. Um, uh, but mostly have more experience applying those rules. So that's really the big difference is they just expect more out of you. Okay. Um, and it'd be the same thing, here I go again with the operational standpoint. Uh, you know, when I conduct a type ride for somebody at American Airlines on a 737, even though our standard of performance is the same, I still expect more out of a new hire FO than if you were a, you know, if you got a job at Envoy. But if you read the standards, they'd be the same. I mean, they're, they're going to say the same words, you know, take off, must maintain heading within plus or minus 10 degrees, within 10 to 20 pitch attitude, you know, on a V1 cut. It's going to be the same. Let's launch into some of these here. So I guess first question is how can pilots prepare now? So you see a lot of from private on. How can they prepare now if they're career-minded for an airline to interview or to work for an airline, mm -hmm. how can they prepare? Well, I guess that'd be you, Mike. Right. You're at the private pilot level, right? Talk to Mike. What can you tell him? If he wants to be an airline pilot in four years, what can he mm -hmm. start doing now? How can he? Well, so we've talked mostly, this page and what we talk mostly about is, is um, human factors questions. Um, but there is a technical portion to it, too. So, um, but Kerry, what you probably see at your stage of the game, and Ben, you're maybe just catching on to, that is probably an enigma for you right now, Mike, is that we talk about the building block, you know, when you got your CFI and you had to do your FOI, right? We talked about building blocks and building a foundation. So everything we do, when you, when you get your private pilot certificate, it isn't, and, and then the next step is, in your case, you're going to go over to the college over there and start your instrument work, right? You don't take what you learned here and go, okay, done. Let's go fly through the clouds, right? Everything that we did, that we're going to do to fly through the clouds is based on having this foundation, right? And then same thing when we do commercial level, right? You, go, you, you, you learn your commercial maneuvers and we go through and we relearn all of these rules and regulations. Um, and then you get to the CFI level and you find out that, oh, that's just a regurgitation of everything I just learned in the commercial, right? Um, uh, and then you get to the multi-engine level where you're doing that and um, maintaining aircraft control on top of doing instrument work while you're getting a, um, uh, doing an, uh, a multi-engine check ride. So all of these are building blocks. So, e so every step of the way is building your foundation to what you're doing. And there's nothing, even though you go, well, what does flying a 172 have to do with flying a 737? Well, a lot. They're pretty much the same, right? Wing still works the same. Stalls still work basically the same, straight wing versus swept wing, but stalls still work the same, stall recovery still works the same. We still fly ILSs the same, uh, all of that. So, so again, not having the mentality of I'm just checking things off the box. At every stage that you're, of your training, 
you're learning something you're going to use the rest of your career. So that's how I'd answer. So that's from a stick and rudder standpoint. What about from a personal or personality standpoint? Because it's a people. Thing. Well, it's same thing. So. Um, you get a, well, there's a stick and rudder standpoint, there's a knowledge standpoint, right? Just like any other ride we take, there's always the knowledge written test, and then there's the oral knowledge test, and then there's the go out and let's go do it stuff. Um, so you have to have that same concept about building on all of those and not discarding anything that we learned along the way is the same, and then it's the same with your interpersonal relationships and how you, how you deal with those. Uh, we talk a lot during FOI about how you know, instructor responsibilities Right? Um, you know, you're an advocate for aviation. Um, how, how are you going to talk to somebody? Um, <laughs> you could post this one. Um, uh, one of the questions I asked during FOI recently for instructor responsibilities, I gave somebody a scenario where they were up at Woosley during the pancake flying. Right? And um, uh, they, were th they were an instructor and they're there with a couple of their students and they're getting ready to get the tables out, make pancakes for everybody, and everything's great. And this 172 comes in and lands, and it's just, it's just got off. It's, they think they're going to crash. Guy lands halfway down the runway, comes to a skidding halt off the, end of the, off the end of the runway, parks the airplane, gets out, and goes, all right, where's breakfast? Okay. So as an instructor, then what was, what's that responsibility level for that instructor? All right. So what I was getting at was trying to get him to admit or talk that one of his responsibilities is overall aviation safety. It wasn't his student, never seen him, doesn't know him from Adam, never seen the airplane, never seen the pilot, but he does have a responsibility to talk to that pilot and say, hey, how did that go? Right? And then to take his students and say, hey, what did you see there? What did you learn there? Right? Not necessarily having to bring the two together, but those interpersonal relationships, right? And as we're maybe a little bit younger or newer in this industry, or maybe not so good at, at making those discussions or having those, those discussions with people. Um, so as you go through your career, thinking about how am I going to interact, how am I going to interact with, the, um, with an instructor I might not like, right? but he's the only one I got or she's the only one I got right now. Um, or I might have a student that I don't like, but still going to have to do the job, right? Um, so as you work through those relationships, know that that's going to be the very same because you're going. I guarantee you, you're going to fly with a captain you don't like, and a co-pilot you don't like, but you still have to go to Cleveland with him, right? And whatever whatever crazy thing rears its head while you're going from Detroit to Cleveland, um, and deal with them with that. Like maybe the static wicks are falling off the airplane <laughs> in this case. So again, to paraphrase that, again, it's the building blocks that you're going to do as you progress. Right. Um, again, going back to your question, Ben, what's the difference between a regional and a major level? Well, at the regional level, again, we know you may not have had that many experiences confronting a captain or dealing with bad weather or having to question a dispatcher or question a mechanic or work through a problem that doesn't line up for you. Um, but when you get to the major level, we expect that you have. We expect that you have the, those tools and resources to work through that a little more efficiently and eloquently. And then next question here overall, how can a pilot set themselves apart from other candidates? Mm, well, education and experience are the two biggest things, right? And we always, we quantify that to no end, right? So we say, do you got a degree? And how many hours do you got? How many type ratings do you have? Um, so, that would be the first and foremost. It, and it's, I mean, it's just obvious that the more flight time you have in your logbook, more, more um, marketable, marketable you're going to be. But of course, that's not the bottom line answer to that, right? It, you know, I could, um, I'm not knocking it, but you could have 1,500 hours of RV time, right? It's a great airplane, love it. Um, but a Western student's going to have uh, 1,000 hours in a Piper Semo. That's going to set them apart. Um, uh, and experience. So in today's environment, I'm sure as you know, there is not a lot of other opportunities to be, besides being a flight instructor. There are not a lot of jobs out there you can go do, particularly single engine, that you're going to be able to build flight time. Um, getting to be some more opportunities cargo-wise to go fly multi-engine turbine, heavy-ish heavy airplanes. Right? Not an actual heavy, but large, 
more than 12.5. Um, so some of those opportunities exist. But again, the value of what you got out of that versus the value of what you got out of flight instructing, it's a balance. Right? Um, are you going to get a lot of interpersonal skills um, flying a Beach 1900 from here to Milwaukee at night? Probably not a ton. You're going to get some. You're certainly going to learn a lot of other, a lot of stuff. But as a CFI, you're getting all that interpersonal skill on a daily basis. So, um, so one is not necessarily better than the other. Um, but uh, I think maybe an answer that more pointed to what you're talking about interview-wise. Uh, the first thing would be um, make sure you put an application in that doesn't have any errors on it. Make sure it's spelled correctly. Um, I personal anecdote from somebody who shall remain unnamed, but it was interviewing at a certain major airline. Um, he's going to kill me if he figures this out. And I said this, and you're thinking about putting this on. A um, uh, couple things had five failed check rides on his application, so that was obviously not a deal killer because the guy was there, but. Those needed to be addressed. And when that was on the application of, well, what maneuver did you fail? And I won't say what it was, but not only was it spelled wrong, it was autocorrected to something that we don't even do in aviation. There's actually no maneuver on any check ride that has this thing, right? And so that applicant to that airline never caught that, never, never read his own application to say, hmm, <laughs> I guess it wasn't that. And just in case that guy's listening for we post this for somewhere, but so um, but tell, tell us about your journey. Gone. Yeah. Goes. What was the biggest leap for you? You know, each in aviation there's kind of runs on the ladder, right? Private instrument, commercial. What was the biggest reach that you had to go from? I think it certainly it was uh, it was going to the regional level. We called it the commuters in those days. So it was getting hired at Masaba. Um, so that was uh, so going to school at Masaba, going to ground school, learning an airplane. I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, uh, so, by the grace of God, I made it through, and they taught me everything I needed to know to pass their check rides and fly their airplanes, and, and um, so th that was that was probably the biggest the biggest so your reach I did. Your airmanship kind of took a, an exponential mm -hmm. leap. Uh, um, I was lucky enough to be extremely naive to not know that that's what was happening to me, but. Just the breadcrumbs right every day, just yep. taking the breadcrumb and then you look yep. and think, wow, I yep. really a lot. Yep. Now I look back and go, I can't believe I did that. And so that's sort of my motivation for what I do now. Helping, you know, I like being a DPE. I like working for American Airlines. I like being a DPE. Um, uh, it has its advantages, but overall it's about the ability to reach back to you guys and go, here, let me, let me show you what I screwed up. Yeah. Let me show you and let me try to make your road at least a little bit easier. I'm probably not very successful with that, but that's what. But yeah, that would be the biggest one. Yeah, going to from from the regional to American was a was a a leap. Um, I had a lot more tools and resources to do that, and I also the disadvantage was I wasn't quite as naive as I was when I went from flying Bob and Hadman's 310 to flying the Sabas Dash 8, um, but. Uh, so I kind of knew that, oh crap, this is a lot of work. <laughs> so. Uh, you do what you're getting into anyway? Yeah. Okay, so let's work through some of these interview questions. Uh, one that came up all the time as I read through multiple scenarios is what is your greatest weakness? I think we can talk about our strengths pretty easily, but sometimes it's challenging in an interview situation. You know, how we all have weaknesses, it's all true, right? Mm -hmm. Not all good at everything. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, at what point when you share a weakness is, because I'm always afraid it's just going to be a deal breaker. Mm -hmm. So this question always comes in the form, or used to come in the form of, rate yourself as a, on a scale of 1 to 10 as a pilot. Right? So you were never more than an 8, you were never less than a 7. So you're either a 7 or 8. That's why you answer that question. Right? Because you don't want to say uh, uh, you're Chuck Yeager. You don't want to say I'm a 10. Um, I don't but, think he would even say he was a 10. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He might. Um, <laughs> okay. um, I met him one time in passing. I said hello, and he said hi. 
Um, um, so yeah, you don't want you don't want to say you're chucky. You don't want to say you don't have any deficiencies. But at the same time, you you, you want to identify that there's areas that I can work on. But if you say you know, you say yeah, you know, I have a really crappy instrument scan. It's just awful, right? That's not that's not what they want to know. Um, uh, and again, every question is designed to give the interviewer that opportunity to push you to see if they can get you to bend or break. And that sounds draconian, and it's not that draconian. But um, so yeah, if you you know if you give them the opening of, well, I just I, I just really don't like confrontation. Having to confront somebody, you know, once once you open that door, they're just going to keep pushing that. So you want to. You know, what you want to do is you want to take a weakness and then immediately turn it back around into a positive. Well, you know, I really don't like confrontation, so here's what I do to make sure that I can confront somebody when I need to, which is, of course, all these questions, right? Um, so what your weakness is doesn't matter, I don't think. Now, maybe the gouge online about Republic is going to be that don't ever say this. Uh, Envoy is going to say don't ever say that. I don't, I don't think any of that kind of stuff is ever true. That, you know, Del Delta used to put two chairs down. If you sat in the left chair, you wanted to be a captain. If you sat in the right chair, you're too weak. You want to be a co-pilot, and so that was. They did that for real. No, people just made that up. Oh, right? and that yes. became, you know, people go, yeah, geez, I sat down in the right chair and I didn't get the job. Well, that's because you're too weak. You want to be a co-pilot, right? And so these, <laughs> these, these things go all the time. So again, it doesn't matter what you say is your weakness, as long as you don't say something dumb like, I can't scan worth crap. Or I forget to put the landing gear down at least half the time. <laughs> right. Right? That, yeah. I fall asleep a lot of cockpit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not what they want to hear. But again, identify that you have a weakness, but immediately turn that back around into a positive of here's what I do about that. Right. Not that I've got it licked or anything like that. But awesome. That's how I address yeah. that. All right. Here's some, uh, a, a litany of these questions came up and having to do with interpersonal relationships between captains and crews and such. Scenario, you come down to the hotel lobby, you find your captain in a heated dispute with the hotel manager. How do you respond? <laughs> Ask questions. <laughs> or grab your, U well, you don't grab USA Todays any longer. Um, look at your phone and get on the van. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know if there's anything in particular that a, that a particular airline, if they're asking this question, exactly what they're getting at. But again, it's it's confrontation, um, or seeing, you know, what's can you interject yourself into a situation politely, correctly. So, how would I handle that? <laughs> well, if I, if I was at work right now, of course, I have a different position at work. I'd probably I would I'm in a supervisory position, so I'd have to jump in right away and talk to them. Um, but if I if I were a line FO and and that were the case and the captain was in a heated argument, I would I would ask him what so you know what is what's the issue? What, what are you upset about? Um, and you know take it from there. Um, Has this happened? Uh, what well, variations of? Um, Again, this this particular question is probably better directed at someone that has a lot of experience with interviewing and HR stuff. Um, but in, your, I mean, in your line experience, has there, have you seen confrontation between crew and mm -hmm. other industry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> some of them are benign. Some of them, people walk, you know go over the line. Um, so I would tread lightly with what how I would answer that. I, I would want more information. I would answer that by saying, well, I'd want some more information. I'd ask questions, see what he says. Or she. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Ready for the next one? Yeah, sure. You ask a flight attendant for a Coke with a lime. A passenger notices and is concerned you're drinking a cocktail. How do you handle the situation? Well... So each airline's going to have their their gouge in the internet. So I would I would say tailor this question to whatever you find on the internet about what that company is talking about. Um, and again, I would need more information. What how how is the um, how is the passenger concerned? Did they did they make a statement? I think you're drinking. 
Um, yes. Did they did they did they, did they did they make did they make a funny joke? Maybe they said to apply a yeah. I put a co I always put a lime in my cocktail too. Um. Again, this is this is an area where you're going to need to balance what's going on. I'm going to need to know, you know, am I being accused of of drinking? If I'm being accused of drinking, I'm going to have to take a different path. If somebody just made an off-color joke, I can either let that just go or make it very clear that, you know, nope, this is a can of Coke and I just put a lime in it. That's all it is. And um, so if a passenger does accuse you of it, then what, what angle do you take? I, if, I'm, if I'm outright accused of, of consuming alcohol while on duty, I will have to remove myself from the flight and go seek. Uh, I'll, well, I'll remove myself from the flight. If the company decides to administer a test to verify that or not, then that's up to them. What if you're mid-flight? If you... How do you remove yourself from the flight? Yeah, that's... Uh, at that point, um, you have again. You'd have to. Uh, I'd have to ask the individual. Are you insin Are you saying that I am drinking? If you think I'm drinking, then when we land, we're going to have to take this down a different path. We're going to have to go get a drug test, go get an alcohol test, and prove. Well, so that's that's not taken lightly necessarily. No. No, it's not. Yeah. So again, that in that situation, it depend. Am I accused, or was it an off, off color joke? So even if you're if you're accused, or the passenger just wants to know you're not, is it good enough for you to say, "Hey, I just you know our flight attendant said that you're concerned about this. I just want you to know it's, there's no alcohol in there." Or you could relay it through the flight attendant. Um. Yeah, I, again, I'm going to start answering from the Czech Airman side of what we're going to do online. Yeah. So this may, not, this may not jive with what your interviewer and what they're trying to go down with that road. is. What I teach our captains is when it comes to passenger disturbances, with the exception of what, we, what would be a threat to the aircraft, an actual safety threat, there's there's nothing I can't handle by not getting out of my seat. So I'm going to stay in my seat and handle that. If the flight attendant comes to me and says, there's a passenger back here that's accusing you of, of consuming alcohol. Fantastic. I make a phone call. We call it a CSM at our company. Get me the security manager down here. Bring him down to the airplane. I'm going to remove myself from the flight. Um, uh, so I'm I'm not going to confront that passenger. You know, you see this stuff on YouTube where the captain comes out and does all these things. We don't, that, we, we don't do that. We don't train our pilots to do that. Um, uh, we have people who are specifically trained for passenger disturbance. The flight attendant is better trained and equipped to deal with that interpersonal deal than I am. And then if it escalates beyond that, we have, we have people that are trained to, if we're on the gate, doors open and we're not going somewhere, uh, we have people that are trained to, to come deal with that situation. Um, so, so that's really how it gets handled in this day and age. So you can stay focused on what you're doing and let you Oh, that's, yeah, that's one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the other is, um, I don't know if I you know, think about exactly what procedures I'm talking about that might be used here, but, um, if... If I'm on the airplane and a, uh, there's a passenger on the airplane that is becoming a problem for whatever reason, the flight attendant is um, concerned about that person, that person um, uh, is becoming a problem, uh, they bring that to my attention as a captain of the airplane, and then I bring that to the attention of our CSM, um, and we make a decision between all of us about how that's going to be handled. Ultimately, as the captain, my decision is final. So... So have a huddle session and yeah, kick it we literally call it the huddle. So you're, yeah. you're halfway but between. But I, I generally, if my decision is that person is not going to travel on the airplane, I, I don't, I don't even, I, I don't even get up. Simply, that person's 23D is getting off the airplane. You handle. 
right? So, so I, that would be probably something you want to keep in mind as you move into some of these questions, that most airlines are going to expect you to deal with it in that general fashion. They, they do not want you as the captain or the first officer to be confronting passengers. It never goes well. You're not, you're not trained, you're not equipped. Right? As a captain, I'm trained and equipped to know that that person either can go with us or cannot. So. But as far as being the bouncer, that's someone else's job. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we're not. Now, if it comes down to it, if, if you know, as some of these things that you've seen on YouTube where um, uh, violence erupts and it's directed toward another crew member, uh, we're gonna defend that crew member. But if two passengers are in the back duking it out, they're going to duke it out till the cops get there. So we're not getting involved in that. So it's not it's not going to go well. So you're halfway between San Francisco and Hawaii, and you know somebody makes a comment to the flight attendant. You know, I saw you put a lime in there. I'm concerned that you might be drinking. Should the flight attendant just handle that? That would be the that would be the ideal situation at that point. If if that can be handled at that that spot, just the flight attendant. Fine. No, I'm sure there's no alcohol in here. He just like yeah. a lime with his coke. Yeah. And be done with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can I add one thing? Yeah. I did see a recent video of a captain, I think it was last year, that did kick a passenger off of a flight. Um, I wasn't sure maybe the air the airline had a different policy mm -hmm. or it's very possible. It was breaking it. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's very possible. It's very yeah. possible that airline has a different policy. It's very possible that that pilot was not acting within the company's policy. Yeah. So I can tell you what our policy is. Right. Okay. Um, um, but, well, I can tell you what most of our policies <laughs> certain things I can't tell you. Uh, it's not classified, but, uh, but certain things we, yeah. we don't talk about. But, um, but yeah, I mean, um, for instance, uh, I forget where I was going, um, but we were in the gate, and um, a flight attendant, uh, so service animals are a big issue now, and we're in... Uh, that rule has changed recently to the only service animals we can have are dogs. And they have to be vetted. They have to have, not, not a vet, but they have to vet their paperwork. Um, they actually have to be certified as a service dog, as a service animal. And the only service animal we'll accept is dogs and miniature ponies. I don't even get into that, but we actually accept miniature ponies as a service animal. Yes, I know. Um, so... Uh, a person had gotten on the airplane with the service dog, and that service dog then was not at a kennel because it was a service dog. And the service dog bit a flight attendant. So another flight attendant came forward and informed me that, hey, the person with the service dog's dog just bit the flight attendant. And I said, okay. Have them removed from the aircraft. There was no further discussion needed. And uh, so the flight attendant said, okay, well, we're going to go get this, the CSM that we call it. And we'll, we'll see what they have to say about it. I said, that's fantastic. Go get the CSM. And when you get the CSM, you can tell them that I told them to take the dog and the passenger off the aircraft. So CS, the, uh, the flight attendant that got bit comes back. And um, it turns out she's got a very large ring on her finger. It's a big piece of metal. It's like a shield. And so she says, I'm the one that got bit, but the dog actually bit my ring, so I'm not hurt in any way. But the dog did lunge out at me, unprovoked. I was just walking to the out dog. Bit me. I said, okay. I said, well, when you see the agent, make sure you tell that, that person that, and that my decision is the person and the dog are off the airplane. So the agent came down to the flight deck as we're doing our stuff and getting ready and, and says, I'm here to talk to the person about the, uh, with the service dog that bit the other person. I said, okay, well, when you get back there, they're in seat, blah, 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 and you can talk to them, but remove them, remove the person and the dog from the aircraft. They're not going with us. Well, I'm going to go talk to them, this agent says. Fantastic. Have fun. So this agent comes back, and she's crying because the dog has bit her. <laughs> and she says, I'm taking the dog off the airplane. I said, okay, good decision. <laughs> but again, in the end, or in the beginning, that was my decision. And that was not going to... But we went through all of our policies and procedures, and... That became the decision in the end. But at no time was I going to go up and tell that person, get off the airplane. Mm -hmm. The trained people can go back there and get bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mr. Zermick, thanks for coming to our interview. Uh, question for you. If you don't agree with a rule, do you still always comply? Absolutely. Even uh, if 
ATC gives you an instruction that you deem unsafe? Oh, that's different. Um, but if there if there is a rule or regulation that's in FARs, our FOM, which is your company manual or your AFM, yep, yep. Doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not, you must comply with it. Now, if you get to the safety of flight and you have to exercise your, your uh, pilot and command emergency authority, that's a whole different deal. Um, and you have to comply with Now, ATC instructions are the same, right? I have to comply unless I can't comply in the interest of safety, but, but absolutely. All right. After a long ground delay, you receive your takeoff clearance. As you line up, the fuel drops a few pounds below minimum takeoff fuel. You let the captain know, hey, Cap, we're just 20 pounds low here. He says, ah, it's no big deal. What do you do? We've been waiting here all day. we got to go. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of planes behind us. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if we turn around and go back to the gate, it's going to cause a huge delay for all these people. Yep. So, and I'm assuming that you're the first officer in this situation and you're uncomfortable with flying with less than 20 pounds of, of fuel. Well, it's going against our op specs. We all have right. to... We have to maintain this level according mm -hmm. to our dispatch. Yeah, so that's where I'd start with that. All right, I would I would start with informing the captain of the situation, um, and what 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 I'm not going to do is what we called hint and hope. So I'm not going to make hints. I'm not going to hope that he catches my hints. So I'm going to tell him, hey, captain, we are 20 pounds below min fuel. In fact, I'm just going to say, captain, we are below min fuel. All right? I would expect that the captain would take the appropriate action, which is we're not legal for takeoff now. So we'll have to take some other course of action. We don't necessarily have to go back to the gate. We could change our alternate. We could change our add fuel. We could change our, our hold fuel. Um, so there's different avenues we could take. But I would clearly state that and that I'm uncomfortable with. If, if the decision is, well, we're going anyway, I would clearly state I'm uncomfortable with that and I don't think we should do that. And that is in violation of the company policy. Is there a level of... Um, confrontation, so to speak, between crew, you know, I'm uncomfortable, or other key words like I'm uncomfortable, or this is unsafe, or mm -hmm. you know, there, there are kind of certain levels of threat analysis or threat proclamation. Yeah, there's, not, there's nothing formal. Each airline is going to have their own language that they're going to use. Uh, but all of that would be true. Yes, I'm uncomfortable. This is in contrary to company policy and procedure. This is contrary to um, the airplane operating manual. Um, some statement like that. Again, don't hint and hope. A clear statement that this is in violation, this is not good, I'm not comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're, so what you're trying to get at, too, and I figured you'd push me harder, uh, there is a point. All right, so um, there is a point where the captain is going to have to make a decision about what that person is going to do in any given circumstance. And that captain has final authority as to what they're going to do. They may have to exercise emergency authority to take off. Well, you couldn't exercise emergency authority to take off with less than 20 pounds, or 20 pounds inside of min takeoff fuel. Uh, that would be what we call procedural intentional noncompliance. But, um, but if you're in the air, there's a point where you're going to have to make a decision. Um, and while you may not agree with that as the first officer, you may have to comply with what's going on up to the point where you're going to crash the airplane or whatever doomsday we can come up with, right? Um, I can give you an example, but a, a fairly benign example. Yeah. So uh, on one particular day, we're going into Chicago. I'm the first officer on the MD-80, and we've had multiple holds. We actually came from Detroit to Chicago. We held on the east side of Chicago for thunderstorms, finally got released, came around the south side. Storms built up again around the back side of storms, so now we're holding over there. And we... Uh, and. Chicago has gone into a uh, in chaos mode. Um, there's so much radio traffic, you can't get a call in. So we're in a hold with an EFC time that is well past because we can't say or do anything besides continue to hold. And so we were, uh, we were at our bingo fuel, we, we call it, at our airline. Most people call it the same thing, but uh, we're at the point where we got to go somewhere. So the captain's decision was we're going to Madison. And he said, I'm turning the airplane and I'm flying to Madison. If you can get a call into ATC to let them know that we're doing that, do so. But I'm turning and going. Um, at first, I thought, eh, this is not a, I don't think we should do that. I don't know what words I used at the time, but I thought, no, we should probably continue to hold until we get a, a clearance to go that way. But he said, no, 
I'm going to, I'm going to Madison. So we turned the airplane and we flew off to Madison. Was it Vietnam? Mm, we were scattered in and out. Clouds probably like what you see on the horizon, but there were there were storms. It wasn't solid IFR. Um, and um, you know, this not meant to be a bravado story or anything about look how we saved the day, but. Um, uh, so we, we turned north, we went to Madison, air traffic control never said a word to us. We found our own frequency for Madison approach. We called them up and said, we just diverted out of Chicago, we're about 20 miles to the south, and we're going to land in Madison. And, okay, air radar contact, cleared for, you know, got the airport in sight or whatever, whatever it is we did on the down. I don't, I don't particularly remember that part of that approach. Um, but there was a point where action had to be taken, and the captain needed to take it in action. I expressed some concern with that, but in the end, I was, well, yes, we need to go somewhere, so. So it wasn't a choice between unsafe action and a safe action. It was just a choice between a couple safe actions. Yeah. I had one view of what I thought we should do. The captain had a different. And you had four stripes, I have three. So it's up to him. So, so we talk about something in the airline industry called the authority gradient. Have you ever heard this term? Okay. So if you have a captain and first officer sit in the cockpit, and we draw a line across the top of them, and so gradient being what, what, how steep is this line? Is it this way or is it that way? And so what we want with authority, authority gradient in the cockpit or the flight deck is uh, if this is the captain and this is the first officer, so I'm looking this way here and you guys are looking in the front of the cockpit, but uh, we want that authority gradient tilted just slightly in the favor of the captain. So we want that line just a little bit higher over that person's head than the first officer's head. Right? Um, <clears throat> the reason we want it that way is because we don't want a steep authority gradient. Right? If this authority gradient is too steep, captain's calling all shots and the FO is getting beat down and knocked in the ground and can't offer anything. And anything that that first officer might offer is disregarded usually by a captain in a steep, a steep authority gradient. We also don't want vice versa. We don't want it tilted in the first officer's favor. Right? Captain is in the left seat for a reason. He's more experienced, generally speaking. Uh, he's accepted the responsibility. He or she has accepted the responsibility. Um, and it's their job at this point, when it comes down to it, they've got to make the decisions. So we don't want the captain giving up the authority to the first officer that he had. But at the same time, we don't want this. Huh? So we want, it, we want it slightly tilted in the captain's favor so that they can get all the information and resources from the first officer to make a decision that they need to make and then make that decision. So that's a term you'll hear is... Uh, the, the authority gradient in the, in the flight deck was too steep or was inverse, meaning the first officer had too much authority. So if, if in your estimation the captain's going to do something unsafe, he's going to peak below minimums, he's going to penetrate a thunderstorm, I mean, at what point do you say, that's not how we're going to do it as an FO? Well, you're going to have to incorporate your company policies and procedures. So in your case, if, if, if he's thinking about taking a peak below minimums, um, yeah, if, if, if that were stated ahead of time, hey, I'm, I'm going below minimums because we're getting in, uh, we'd have a discussion about that. Hey, I'm uncomfortable with that. What are you talking about? You know, decision altitude is decision altitude. What, what, do you, what do you mean? What are you doing? Why would you do that? Um, so they'll have to justify that in some way. If it gets down to the point where the guy says, hey, I'm just, that's what I'm doing, um, you know, you have to state, I'm uncomfortable with this. And, 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 and this would be different than him saying, I'm going to fly the airplane into the ground. But now, now we are in a different environment, right? That's not what we're talking about. Um, but you would have to, if it were known ahead of time, you'd have to question this. If it's not known ahead of time and you're at decision altitude and we're not going around, you need to fall on company policies and procedures. So you're going to have some type of call out. Right? So you're going to be at minimums, whatever that company's call out is. Somebody's going to have to call minimums. If you know you're below minimums, you don't see the required items to land, the visual references, um, you make your call out, which is probably going to be go around. Right? So at our airline, if anybody in the flight deck at any time calls go around, even the captain who's in charge, with a small caveat, but uh, we're required to go around. Right, so, I you know, check airman on the airplane flying a regular flight without my first, well actually I could be a check airman, um, first day of OE first leg with this first this first officer's first leg, and if we're flying along and that first officer says go around I I have to comply with that, unless I deem it uns 
Yeah, yeah. So unless I deem it unsafe. Um, so, um, uh, again, falling back on company policies and procedures of, ha of stating, go around. Captain, go around. Captain, do you hear me? Go around. Each company is going to have some type of methodology for non-responsiveness to your calls. So in our case, if somebody were to say go around and there wasn't a response, you would make a second call for go around. And if there wasn't a response, you would consider that other person incapacitated and you would then take command of the aircraft. There's a whole lot that goes on with that. You're going to have some type of methodology for non-responsiveness to your calls. So in our case, if somebody were to say go around and there wasn't a response, you would make a second call for go around. And if there wasn't a response, you would consider that other person incapacitated and you would then take command of the aircraft. There's a whole lot that goes on with that. Okay, here we go. During a pre-flight, and I'm assuming the FO does the pre-flight. Typically, but that can be delegated. Okay. Yep. Could the pre-flight walk around to the aircraft call? Right. Mm -hmm. You notice mm -hmm. too many static wicks are missing from the airplane for dispatch. You let the captain know it's a small outstation. You're out at Dubuque or someplace. It's the middle of winter. You're based in Miami. You want to go home. The small outstation doesn't have any maintenance or spares. Your captain says, well, I guess it fell off during our flight home, right? What would you do? Uh, you'd have to inform the captain that that... There's a mechanical discrepancy in the aircraft that needs to be entered in the logbook and dealt with in the appropriate fashion. And if that means we're not going because there's no static wicks because we can't defer X amount of static wicks on X amount of surfaces, that's the rule. And then just stick with that. Mm -hmm. The rule's on your side at that point, mm -hmm. or you're on the side of the rule. Yep. Now, as I was reading through a lot of these, and there was a lot of these kind of questions in the gouges, I'm thinking to myself, how many captains are flying around like this? Because they always paint the captain as the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, is that a holdover from kind of a good old boy system, or, or has that changed? I mean, have you run into that as an FO? Uh, all, it, it's all of the above. Um, the, yeah, 30 years ago, was that how the industry handled itself? Yeah. We don't anymore. Um, uh, but of course, the reason is because they're always interviewing first officers. They're, I mean, in today's day and age, we are getting to hiring captains off the street. So that probably questions are beginning to morph a little bit. But previous to in the past year to two years, um, they were always hiring a first officer. So that was, that was an easy transition to make the first officer, the, uh, the captain, the bad guy. Uh, but that's not always the case. First officer can be just as much a bad guy as captain can be. Yeah, but you at least have the authority grade in your favor as the captain. Mm -hmm. right? So if the FO says, ah, that flew off during whatever, on our flight home, right? The captain's like, what are you thinking? And I would think that the captain then could take note of that attitude in the FO. Mm -hmm. He's a supervisor, mm -hmm. I would imagine. To, to some extent, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so it would be more risky for an FO to have that kind of attitude, I would mm -hmm. think, than for mm -hmm. a captain to have that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I think probably to address the question you're asking, is this something I'm going to have to deal with on a daily basis in the airline industry or um, um, uh, fractionals or wherever it is I go? Um, no, you shouldn't. That shouldn't be something you're going to deal with on a daily basis. Do these things happen? Yes. Um, you're going to have to learn to navigate them. But, but yeah, we don't. It, it, um, um, we, we don't. The, the, the industry doesn't operate that way any longer. As, as your anecdotal evidence from your buddy you were talking to at Oshkosh, um, everything's being recorded right? in some fashion. Whether it's ADSB, transponder radar, uh, cameras in the jet bridge, somebody's cell phone in their pocket, everything's being recorded. So it just, that's the way of the world these days. We just, you do what you're supposed to do. Captain doesn't understand a clearance, is about to violate a reg. You try to clarify, they still don't agree. What should you do? Continue to clarify. Yeah. You hit a small bird on the second to the last leg of a trip. Here again, these bad captains. The captain wants to fly home and write it up when you get back to base. What do you do? 
uh, inform the captain that's a mecha mechanical discrepancy in the aircraft and by company policy must be entered in the logbook. How big does the bird have to be before you have to write it up? Um, doesn't say. It doesn't say. Mm -hmm. So it could be a hummingbird. Mm -hmm. Now, so w what people need to understand is, so there are ways to deal with this. That, that's, why, that's why we don't do this any longer in the airline industry is, okay, write it up, bird strike. I, I can guarantee you we've got some maintenance procedure. Was, am I going to be late? Yeah, probably. I'm, I'm probably going to be late because um, we're going to have to call the mechanic out of bed. He's going to come down. He's going to look at it, and he's going to go, yep, no dent, three by five. Yep, good to go. And he's going to write that off in the maintenance. And he's, so the maintenance has their procedure too, right? Mm -hmm. X amount of dent, how much deformity, whatever. They have all yeah. of that probably. Yep. Yeah. They've got all their But you as a dudes. captain or an FO, don't, you don't have that authority to make that determination? Nope. Nope. The captain says, listen, Todd, this is your first first run off the, what is it, IOE or whatever. Um, this fell off on the way home. And you say? It's mechanical discrepancy. needs to be entered in the logbook. We can enter it <laughs> when we land at home. <laughs> You can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what if he does? It won't be with me. And if they don't have static wicks in Dubuque or Sioux City, they probably don't have first officers in Sioux City either. So I'm not going. Really? You're not going on that flight? Mm -hmm. So you, that's your line in the sand? Yeah. If I've identified a mechanical discrepancy in the airplane, it needs to be addressed. So that's your recourse then, is F O is to just back out of the flight? Mm hmm Okay. Mm hmm You hit the ejector seat at that point. Mm hmm Yeah, they're probably not getting <clears throat> I would imagine that this has happened enough times to where there are cut and dried procedures for, for these scenarios, for an alcohol type scenario. So how should we answer that? Well, you're going to have you question the captain, and you interact, and um, and the question will be posed one way or the other, right? So, uh, if, if they if, if they're really trying to be vague, they're not going to let you let you off on your you know he's got he's been drinking. But if you know he's been drinking, or you or he or she or whatever has been drinking, you know the captain's been drinking, or you highly suspect that that's the case, then you're going to confront the captain and and. Tell the captain, I, I suspect that you've been drinking. I don't think you should take this flight, and we'll we'll go talk to the supervisor. If that's refused, they do the same thing. You remove yourself from the flight. Just get yourself out of there. Can't go anywhere without you. So that's that's your ultimate recourse. We can talk about it in details leading up to that, but that's where you're going to be. Is hey, I'm uncomfortable. I'm not taking this flight. What if the captain then, let's say the captain was drinking late, and now, again, he wasn't drinking that morning, he just stayed up too late, he's not within his eight-hour tolerance. Maybe he's within, it's all the same. I think it's Doesn't. .04 or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, what if the captain, after you said that, said, you know what, I'm going to call in sick? Would you? Would that be the end of the matter for you, or would you report that still to HR? Uh, my canned answer would be I would, I would follow the appropriate company channels to address that. And or is this an indication of a pattern? Are those policies designed to discriminate between those two situations? Or and that's not for you to decide. As an FO, it's not. Mm -mm. Okay. So basically, it does. It doesn't matter. Okay. If, so if you if you find yourself in that situation, it doesn't matter that this is a pattern. It doesn't matter that it happened once only. It doesn't matter that. Geez, I'm sorry. I, I literally just did the wrong math. I forgot about the. I forgot it was time change tonight. It's not for you to decide. You take the the appropriate recourses, whatever it is, with that company, and you can always throw this in an interview. This is your sort of get out of jail. Well, I don't know your company yet, but I'll I'll follow the procedures of your company to how to properly report that. So. Gotcha. 
you know, in our case, we have two avenues, you know, company notification, union notification. How do you know to pick? Or both? Well, um, it, it depends. Um, but what we're talking about right here is an interview question. So I'm going to answer that with, I'm going to follow the appropriate company procedures as how to report something like that. Gotcha. Um, but, but yeah, there's, there's resources. But again, back to the interview question. It is not your job to, to decide. Is this a one-off? Does he have a problem or she have a problem? That, that's not your decision. Yep, not your decision. Um, it is not your decision to decide that, that, that the tire needs 125 PSI in it and that it's not it's good with 115. It's not my decision. If it says it needs 125 PSI in it, it's 125 PSI. And we're good. So same, you know, same, same. I, I'm not, I'm not there to make those decisions of, is it, okay, is it okay to fly at seven and a half hours after drinking? Eight or whatever company policy is. Company policy is usually a bit different, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, tell me about a time when you had an over assertive. I, I think this could be split up. When you had an over assertive captain. <laughs> You want me to tie one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> trying to think of something for you. Oh, well, I would throw this back to the interview and say, could you would define it over a, a assertive? Um, the captain that basically um, intimated to you that you were window dressing as an FO. I really don't need to hear from you. You sit there and let me fly the plane. Okay. I got so uh, one time when I was a new first officer in the Dash 8 at Misaba, um, I was flying with a uh, captain who was also a Czech airman um, and um, had a reputation for being very uh, particular. Um, and so I got to the airplane early, make sure everything was ready to go so that when this captain got to the airplane, wouldn't have any issues and we could just move on and do our procedures. So, uh, captain entered the flight deck, introduced myself, even though I've already known each other, but I knew that he did remember me, so I reintroduced myself. And I stated that I had all my duties complete, and if there's anything I could help him with, to let me know. And his response was, this is my side of the cockpit, that's your side of the cockpit. You'll do your job, I'll do my job. And I said, yes, sir. And I did my job. And he right, missed everything. Like Just kidding. <laughs> right, that guy probably didn't like kids. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, what about a weak captain? Mm-hmm. It's flown, to, yeah. And I'm imagining that some of these questions are a little bit more for some purpose. What? 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 Like what you define as weak? Yeah. So that goes back to what we were talking about, the authority gradient, right? And we want it tilted in the captain's favor. So, um, trying to think of how to answer this question. Because you, uh, you know, the, the big picture of what you want to answer these questions are is, sure, we've all had this in our lives where we've had somebody who's weak that you're doing something with. Um, but what you don't want to paint a picture of is how I took over. Right, so you want to tread lightly on that. So here's, here's how I would answer this question to you guys. We're sitting on a room, and we're not going to post any of this, but we're, we're sitting on a room. I, I would say when I was at Masaba one time, we were in Roanoke, Virginia going to, I'm sorry, we were in Charleston, West Virginia going to Roanoke, Virginia. And this was back before anybody had any cell phones in their pocket or anything like that. In fact, we didn't even have radar in our outstations. All right, we had radar in the airplanes, but we didn't have... We didn't have the capability to go look at the radar and see what was going on. This particular captain was known for being extremely afraid of any type of thunderstorms. And we knew from flying into Charleston that this short flight over to Roanoke, which is all of about 30 minutes, there was a lot of thunderstorms. We were not going to be able to go straight. We are going to have to deviate and do some other stuff. So as was the the technique at the time, not necessarily perceived, but the technique at the time was Captain Winning called dispatch. Hey, I'm in Charleston trying to go to Roanoke. What's the radar look like? Because our dispatcher had radar. 
Uh, it looks awful, you're going to have to go south. Uh, you can pick your way around this line here, do this, do that, and all that kind of stuff. So he comes back and he tells me, all right, well, we're going to go here and we're going to have to go to this fix and that fix and pick our way through this. Um, and so um, we took off and we had airborne radar. We had radar on the airplane. So it really was just take off, turn the radar on, find the holes, go through the holes. Well. The captain was adamant on following the dispatcher's advice as to where to go, which was right to where the thunderstorms were. Because you can imagine, you know, your handheld radar on your phone has got a delay today. You can imagine in 1995, the delay from a dispatcher's in radar in Minneapolis to calling us on the phone and telling us to go through this hole. That hole was no longer there. So we take off and we're heading towards the weather that's just awful. And... Um, and so uh, the captain was, again, adamant that that's where we're going. That's where the dispatcher said. And I said, no, Bill, we can't go there. That hole's closed. We need to head south, go south of the line, do an end around, come back around this way. And nope, nope, that's where the dispatcher says we need to go. We're going that way. And, and, and I said, Bill, we're not going that way. We need to go south. We need to turn now. And um, um, I didn't get any response. So I said, Bill, I'm taking the airplane and we're going south. For the airplane. And... Bill was not very useful for the rest of the flight. He was kind of incapacitated. He was concerned about the weather, concerned we hadn't gone to the right spot, that this was now some kind of big problem. Um, and so then when we landed in Roanoke and we're getting ready to go back to Detroit to be done with our trip like you're talking about, we needed Bill to take us back to, the, <laughs> back to Detroit because uh, as much as you need a first officer to fly the airplane, you also need a captain to fly the airplane. But Bill wasn't doing his job any longer, so I needed to step in and do his job. And, and he relented a tremendous amount of authority then to me for the remainder of the flight from Roanoke back up to Charleston. So not an ideal situation. But I wouldn't answer that question in an interview and talk about the second part of that. What I would talk about is... Hey, the cap so the captain got advice from dispatch about a particular route that they th that that person thought was going to be a good route. It turns out once we got flying, that route wasn't wasn't good. The hole had closed up, and we needed to make a different decision. The captain seemed very focused on taking that route, and so I needed to be adamant with him about taking a different route to in order not to fly through the thunderstorms. And I got to the point where I said we need to turn south now, and he complied with that. Didn't your onboard radar show that? Yeah. lock on that dispatch report. He was going to do what he was told. And now he was getting scared because we were in the weather and getting knocked around and lightning and all kinds of stuff. And so right, so, yeah, yeah. so again, that was that's the real story. Uh -huh. I'm not telling an interviewer that right. I took the airplane from Bill and then I continued the rest of the flight and his authority <laughs> gradient was like this. Right? I don't add those details to it. Right. But so <clears throat> I don't know, some of you guys, something that the FO can do in an interpersonal level to try to build confidence in the captain. Sure. Um, do their job. Um, the captain probably isn't there, and in the case, Iden's case, he, he's not there um, because he got lucky. He's got probably more experience as the first officer, being a first officer than the first officer does. And so that's one thing you need to realize as, a, as an FO when you begin doing these jobs and showing up and you're going to fly with all kinds of new captains. They do know what they're doing. They have a tremendous amount of experience behind them, but they're, that may be their first trip in the left seat. And um, everybody is scared on their first trip in the left seat, um, whether they admit to it or not. Um, so, you know, the best thing you can do is, is simply do your job. Uh, you're, you're, you don't... Don't try to usurp the authority um, and, and don't assume that that captain is not doing their job simply because they're new. Um, that's the best way you can help. As, a, let's say you're the captain and uh, 737, what's the total crew? Is it five? Uh, four flight attendants, the back two pilots. So six. Mm-hmm. It's our, our, our minimum crew, the way the seats we have. It's driven on how many seats you have in the airplane. Okay. And I guess how often do you run into non-professionalism from anyone on the crew? From time to time, but rarely, rarely have I had a, a case where I need to deal with it. 
um, I had a mechanic that we had to have a discussion outside the airplane recently with. But, but that goes back to what you're talking about interview-wise. So in this case, we were working with an MEL for a fuel gauge that the way I interpreted the MEL was not the same as, and what we needed to do procedure was not the same as this mechanic. And um, so I, I was happy to leave it with, well, we don't agree with this, and I'm the guy going to take the airplane. So this is my interpretation, and this is what I'm going to do if I'm going to fly the airplane. And he said, no, this is what you're going to do, and you're going to fly the airplane. And so then we had to have a discussion outside the airplane with nobody else around. And I informed him that that would not be the case. Then I talked to his maintenance supervisor, who does have authority over me, and told me that is, in fact, what I was going to do, and it was what I did. <laughs> so I won the argument, lost the, or I, I won the battle, lost the, uh, lost the lost war. war. Um, so a couple of technical questions. Uh, if I leave the cockpit and the flight rates here at 24,000, you need to be at 18,000 by a certain weight point. You're at 400 knots. When do you need to start down? How fast is your vertical speed? Are those legitimate mental mass scenarios mm -hmm. in the cockpit? Mm -hmm. You should be able to, to do a three to one descent mentally. Um, and then you should be able to figure out what that descent rate is. The rule of thumb, what they're getting at there is if you're doing um, you're doing 500 knots over the ground, you're going to do 2,500 feet per minute. So you're going to multiply your your um, your ground speed by five to come up with your descent rate um, to give you a three to one descent. So um, anybody familiar with three to one descent? It's glide slope. Yeah, it's the same same as it was. Um, so we'll, we use a three to one descent before VNAV. Um, so what you say is you're going to go uh, uh, three miles for every thousand feet that you need to lose. So you, so if I'm going to, uh, what you're looking at is if I'm going to be 10 miles out from the, from the airport um, on a three to one descent, I want to be at 10,000 feet. Right? Um, 70, uh, I use the cardinal no, no ones anymore. If you're 15, you're 75. If you're 30, you're 60. Um, I can't even do it anymore. But you multiply your altitude times times three to get your distance to start down for a three to one. And that's assuming that we do it at idle. And then the descent rate would be your ground speed times five. Gotcha. Uh, there were you can get a more eloquent answer out of that if you just Google it. But that was, right. And we don't really do that anymore because we do everything in VDAF. <laughs> so. so the computer figures that out. Mm -hmm. But don't give that answer. <laughs> <laughs> My G530 figures this out for me. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of tell me about a time scenario questions. Mm -hmm. um, one that I think is interesting is tell me about a time when you were in a dangerous situation in an airplane and how you handled it. So I'll give you another, I think I can give you maybe two more examples. Of um, and again, so I'll give you the, the, the full example. And then we'll tailor it to how you would actually answer this. So um, very similar to Iden. I was a brand new Saab captain. And <clears throat> um, I was a, it was a bad weather night. I think the computers had gone down. And we had a rule at Masaba that if you had, uh, don't quote me on this number, but I think if, you, if we were at what's it called a high minimums captain, um, so I had less than 100 hours of PIC type in the airplane, we had a rule that the captain had to make the takeoff and the landing. First officer could fly en route, but the captain had to make the takeoff and landing, regardless of how much time the FO had in the airplane. So I'm on a trip going from, we're gonna go from Detroit to Rhinelander. Now, Detroit to somewhere, and then to Rhinelander, Wisconsin, to spend the night. And it was a bad weather night. I think the computers had gone down that night too, so people are getting reassigned. And so my first officer was off the flight, so they, they reassigned a, a guy that just had come in from a trip. He thought he was going home. And contractually, they were allowed to do this, so they grabbed this guy and go, nope, you're going with Todd to wherever it was. I, I had a, maybe we landed in central Wisconsin, then went up to Rhinelander. That would seem to make sense. So we, it was a two-leg deal. And <clears throat> late at night, crappy weather, and the, so this first officer is extremely upset that he's been reassigned to fly. 
never flown with him before. I don't know him, never met him. Um, uh, but he's extremely upset that he's going with me. He was supposed to be going on vacation the next day or something like that. And, um, uh, and, and then finds out that I'm a high men's captain. So he can't do on a two leg deal. He cannot do a takeoff or landing. So now he's, now he's doubly pissed. So I do the first takeoff and we land wherever it is in central Wisconsin. And, um, he's whining and complaining the entire way, but I figure, all right, you know, I'd be mad too. So you just let him bend. So rah, 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 the whole way. uh, and while we're, um, while we're, and I'm, and I'm, I've already heard that I'm flying with a new high men's captain, so I can't even fly the plane. And, rah, 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 rah. and so unwisely, I elect to let him fly from Rhinelander or from central Wisconsin up to Rhinelander to try to placate him a little bit. I think I maybe, I was close to my high men's and I figured he's experienced. It's, it's a stupid rule, right? Go back to your question. Do you, even if you don't like a rule, do you, do you adhere to it? Right? The answer is yes. I didn't do that. That won't be part of the answer to the interviewer, right? So, but I let this guy fly. And so we go up to Rhinelander, which has an ILS to the east, like a zero on runway nine, no tower. And uh, so we're going in and we get vectored onto the ILS, he's flying, and we've got company behind us coming in from Minneapolis. They've got the same problems going on there late. This is like midnight. And so they've been told minimum speed. They haven't been issued a hold quite yet, but they're got, they've, they've told them they got company in front. So we're gonna go and fly the approach first, land, then they'll get their approach clearance. No tower there. So we've either got to cancel IFR once we're on the ground or in the air in order for them to get approach clearance. So it's overcast, so we hit the marker, um, break out of the clouds. It's about 3,000 overcast, so maybe five miles, something like that, I don't remember exactly. But um, so me being the good guy, I go back to center and said, hey, Masaba, blah, 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 cancel IFR, which on certain rules we could do at night. And so met those rules, so I cancel IFR so the, our buddies behind us get their approach clearance and come in and we can all go to the hotel at the same time. So we're on the glide slope landing and doing our calls and FO Grumpy Pants is still bitching and complaining. And uh, and I look in the touchdown zone and I see uh, a rabbit in the touchdown zone. And I thought, man, a rabbit. Now, I know we're going to win that battle. But, hmm, should I or should I not go around? And as I'm starting to make this decision, I'm getting closer to the runway. And I look and I see, no, it's not a rabbit, it's a jackalope. It's got horns. It's not a, not a rabbit, it's a deer. Okay, not winning that battle, all right? So I said, hey, there's a deer in the touchdown zone, go around. And he says, I don't want to. Said, go around. He says, I'm not going around, I'm gonna, I'm gonna float over top of the deer and land. And I said, no, you're not. I said, go around. He said, I'm not going around. Grabbed the throttles and I pushed him up. And I said, well, you are now. And so we're going around and, and get the gear up and the flaps up and we come back around. So at this point, I'm kind of dumbfounded as to why this argument is ensuing and what's going on and all that. But so keeping my authority gradient going where it needs to go and we're going around. He's still flying the plane. Well, so we make a crosswind, we make a downwind. And as we make that downwind, now going, this is a runway, you know, we come back this way. And now we're sitting here at, at, uh, on the downwind at whatever altitude, I can't remember what. Um, I can see the other airplanes coming down through the overcast light. I can see their landing lights coming down, right? So they're at the marker or somewhere else. They're still IMC. And we go IMC. Oh, crap. I remember, we've canceled IFR, right? Hmm. And then we're back to VMC. I can see the runway again. Wow, what was that? Poof, back to IMC. Holy shit. Was it night or day? It's nighttime. Dark, night, overcast, no, right? So there's a scattered layer over here that we are now poof, 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 going in. Right? Now he becomes visibly upset that we're going IFR, and he says, get me an approach clearance. And I said, I can't get you. <laughs> He's over there landing. There's no way we're not getting an approach clearance. Well, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? I said, well, listen, let me go solid IFR or IMC. We know that's a cloud layer, right? So turn 40, 45 degrees off our heading. We'll go this way and we'll climb. We'll get above it. And then once they land and get their uh, cancel, 
We'll tell them we found a hole, had to climb up through it, we'll get our approach clearance, we'll come back in and land. Well, it didn't have to happen because we never hit another cloud, so these guys come in and land. We tuck in behind them and land out of that. Right. Now, that whole story, I'm not ever telling you that this is what you should be doing. I'm just telling you what I did. Okay. <clears throat> so we land, we, we taxi him, and this FO is just, he is just, it's a deluge of negative comments about me, personally. And so we, we taxi in, and I, I just ignore it. And we taxi in, we shut down, we get the people off. And we had a rule at Nasaba that the captain had to do a post-flight walk around. So uh, finish the shutdown checklist. He's still yapping and bitching, and I said, I'm going to go do the walk around. We'll talk about this when I get back. So I come back. Passengers are gone. Find him in the cockpit. He's got the flight attendant over his shoulder. He's now making numerous derogatory statements about my flying abilities and all kinds of stuff. And so at that point, I knew that anything I was going to respond with was not going to be um, constructive. So I just shut the battery off, shut the airplane down. I said, let's go. We're getting the car. Of course, at this outstation now, we got a crew car we have to drive together to the hotel van. So, And of course, we get to the exit, and he thinks we go right, and I think we go left. And <laughs> So we, so we go to the hotel and um, get our rooms, and I, I elect not to address it. I'm going to address this in the morning. We're supposed to dead head out the next morning, which means we're supposed to catch a flight in the back as passengers back to Detroit. And, when I, and I figure, well, we'll talk about this on the way back. they probably all calm down. And um, uh, when I got there in the morning, it turned out he'd taken an earlier flight, and I never saw him again. So I never addressed it. I'm sure he's probably somewhere telling the exact same story. But with a completely different, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. and you can, yeah, you can decide who's right or not. Yeah. So again, there, there, you would, you would take that story, and I'm not going to tell an interviewer that, you know, um, I let the guy fly when he shouldn't be. I'd leave that detail out. They may, you know, chances of them figuring that out are going to be slim to none. But you could use a scenario like that and talk about that. Um, I certainly wouldn't tell him about going IMC and what my plan was to do this. Um, but I could, I could use that example to say, you know, at one time I made a poor choice. I thought I was helping everybody because I was going to cancel IFR when I got VMC and I followed all our rules and I could cancel, cancel and we wound up having to do a go around because of a deer and now I find myself, you know, at night on a downwind having to get back in an airport that I have to stay VFR because they've got the approach clearance and so it put me in a in a challenging situation, all the while not talking about how the FO was bitching at me and and how that didn't go well and how I didn't confront him afterwards and just let it go. And so, all that. so in a scenario, tell me about a time scenario. If the scenario is tell me about a time you're in a dangerous situation, and part of the reason why you were in a dangerous situation is because you made a bad decision. I mean, how much of that you let out of the bag? Yeah, well, I would take if 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 that was again that if I was going to use that as my interview answer, mm -hmm. right? I would talk about I, I would I would focus in on well, I was trying to be the good guy and canceled, and but then that bit me because I didn't I didn't anticipate there being a deer in the touchdown zone and having to execute a go around, and so now I got myself in a scenario, and I wouldn't say that we went through a couple poofy clouds yeah, or you're flying. So, so leave that detail say, out. You know, my my decision turned out not to be great at the time. Uh, here's how I handled it. Everything ended up safely, and here's what I learned from it. Mm -hmm. Without, you can still put a spin on it. Yeah. To mm -hmm. not necessarily pull the whole curtain back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. What questions you get, Jeff? <laughs> your chance. <laughs> I'm always the one having to answer the questions or ask the questions. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you guys this. A bit, so big picture with interview stuff. Like you got to talk about. So your answer when you answered about um, your greatest weakness, right? You did it. We already had talked about this, right? But you, you went with, well, you gave a weakness and then you immediately went around and turned it into, well, how I can use that as a positive, right? So you want to be forthright in everything that you're going to talk about, right? So if you have failures on your 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 um, 
uh, your training history, you won't talk about that, right? You take responsibility for everything, right? You never, never in an interview lay blame on anybody else. Like in my scenario, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lay the blame that is very well deserved on this FO. I'm gonna take all the blame for myself um, and how I, how I dealt with that. So don't shift blame on anybody. Take responsibility for everything that you, that you've done. Um, be positive about it. I learned from it, like you're talking about, and um, and and be positive how I learned from it and how I'm going to carry that forward. Right? So that's that's how you want to answer all of these questions. All right. And if they say rate yourself as a pilot on one to scale of one to ten, never more than a nine, never less than a less than an eight, right? Or yeah, never more than an eight, less than a seven. So you're a seven or eight. Um, um, but the most important thing, like you're talking about, you're talking about setting yourself apart. Right. Make sure all your documents are up to up to absolute 100% snuff. Uh, pay the money for these these. Uh, I don't know if this is having so much at the regional level, but certainly at the major level, pay the money to these organizations that write a resume for you, check your application, um, and prep you for these interviews. It's it's money well spent, and those companies know what they're doing very well with that stuff. And then show up on time. Nice haircut. Shirt tucked in, nice, nice suit, right? Shoes that are polished. Um, so all of those are, are basic fundamentals that are going to set yourself apart. Right? Um, when you're, when you're, one of the tactics for interviewing is you want to interview the interviewee. We talk about right. So you want to talk, you want to ask them questions, but you want to ask them questions from the standpoint of you don't want to say, well, what base am I going to get when I get hired here? Well, I understand you have a number of bases. Which one is the base that most of the new hires go to? How long will I be on reserve? Well, how long can one expect to be on reserve if they were to get hired here? Never assume you're going to be hired there. Right? You always talk from, hey, if I got hired here, which is really what I want, doesn't, doesn't matter if you don't want. Right? I remember I, I told Spirit Airlines back in 1996 that they were the best up-and-coming airline and by a guy that I wanted to work for them and we didn't know what they'd be like today. But, they were a pretty crappy airline back in those days. But, but that airline, that's who you want to work for, right? That's the best thing since sliced bread. You want to work for them, and it's just an absolute privilege if you could, if you could work for them, right? Um, that's how you always want to frame your, your attitude and your questions. If you were to hire me, right? It's never, well, when you give me this job, you know, how much time off am I going to get between Indoc and Sim? Don't ask that question, right? It's always... Hey, what can, what can I expect from a training footprint what, if I were to get hired here? Um, how long would be the upgrade for somebody that got hired today? Right? Not, how, not how long before I'm, I'm going to be a captain. Right? So always ask the questions. You want to interview the interviewee. You want to, you, want to, uh, you want to be able to throw back that question about, what would you do if the captain shows up drunk? Well, I'd follow your policies and procedures. Well, but what would you do? Well, I'd follow your policies and procedures. I don't know what those are. I'll follow your policies and procedures. Um, so you want to be able to, again, throw that back there. You want to interview the interviewee, but not to the standpoint of, of uh, hey, you, get, you, need to, you need to convince me I want this job. Right? You want that job. Because right? you, you know, what you want to be able to do is to say yes or no to these companies. Right? And the only way to say yes or no is to get them to offer you the job. That's where you want to be. Okay. Any other questions? Well, or this is your chance. What was the um, place online that you would recommend them make my resume and tell me what to do? <laughs> um, the only one I know, oh, geez, uh, Keith Steele is actually, he's an American captain. He's a friend of mine. Um, man, what's his company's name? Something like Flight Level or? You know, I keep it. I, I know I've texted them. What, what's your company's name? Let me see if I can figure that out. Um, but there's another other, other companies, and I, I would highly recommend him. And it's not just because he's my buddy. Everybody I've talked to says uh, he does a great job. Um, da, 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 da. I think it's in here somewhere. Uh, Centerline. Centerline Interview Consulting. Specializes in majors, but I'm sure they, you know, if you look that up, I'm, I'm sure Google will tell you all the other companies that do that same type of work. But Sounds expensive. 
uh, I think for his, his baseline is about 400 bucks. Uh, but they will create a resume for you um, and look over your application and make sure. Um, and then I'm, I think he does some type of interview prep. And then you start paying for services. But when you get to the, when you get to the, certainly the major stage and possibly the regional, because they're paying so much money now. But I, I know 400 bucks is a lot right now. But if that's going to help you get a job, that you're going to be making $100,000 a year, and then as a major airline pilot, you're going to be making, depending, $300,000 a year. So you recommend that for going to the majors or for regionals? Absolutely for the majors. I would look into it for the regionals. You guys are more connected to how that process is. I took a resume yeah. to the career tent at Oshkosh, and I just said, grade this resume. I didn't ask for a job. I didn't ask for an interview. I just said, look at this resume. What do you think? And got feedback that way. Uh, from people, mm -hmm. you know, would this anything on this resume flag you or the look, whatever? Just read through it, and I ask. A couple of Most regions, I think, are going to be database oriented yeah. for putting in an app. But. Airline apps, yeah. mm -hmm. I think, is what it is. Now. Mm -hmm. but, um, and I didn't ask. I didn't ask the pilot guy. I asked the HR person because they're the ones that are going to see the resume first. Mm -hmm. wanted my resume. Probably not. They just were like, put all this flight time in. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's just it's database driven. Right. It spits out a database. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, yep. we appreciate your time. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's fun talking. Like I say, interviewing is not my thing. I'm more of the, the training side of life, but 